The nuclear deal is dead, or at least that's what all the reports say. But on Monday, U.S. and Iranian officials appear to confirm indirect talks between Tehran and Washington last month in Oman, this being the first report of its kind in months. And although both deny reports of an interim nuclear deal, a U.S. official admitted there have been secret talks to reach an understanding on how to de-escalate Iran's nuclear program, its behavior in the Middle East, and its involvement in the Ukraine war. Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei expressing support for an agreement in some areas while maintaining the nuclear program's infrastructure, further saying that the West has failed to stop its nuclear progress until today, and that if Iran wanted to build a nuclear weapon, it would do so. Monday's report prompting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to reiterate Israel's stance that no agreement with Iran will be binding on Israel, which will continue to do everything to defend itself, saying that 90% of the Jewish state's security concerns relate to Iran and its proxies. As Iran's uranium inches closer to 90% enrichment, should the Iran nuclear deal be revived? Dear panelists, let's get to it. Uh, should the Iran nuclear deal be revived? As always, we begin with our quick fire round, 30 seconds each to lay out your initial stance on the matter, and now uh, we pick it up from there. So, uh, Barbara Slavin, please take the lead. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I think it's too late to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. or too late for diplomacy. And that means there can be a de-escalation of tensions, an understanding reached whereby Iran will not uh, weaponize its knowledge and Israel will not attack Iran. We'll also uh, get some of our hostages out and hopefully a reduction in tensions region-wide. Oh, a new status quo, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Richard Goldberg, your thoughts? I also believe that it's impossible to go back to what was already a bad deal simply because Iran has already run through the deal uh, by several years. Uh, unfortunately, we have not actually ended the JCPOA. Iran still benefits legally from the sunset provisions of the UN Security Council and obviously does not want to see those go away with a snapback. And so, unfortunately, we may be moving to where Barbara was talking about this understanding, which effectively is an extortion racket paying Iran to sit on the nuclear threshold mm. for any time of its choosing in the future. Last but not least, Mayor Javan Anfar. Um, I think we cannot go back to the JCPOA because the IAEA has two questions mm. regarding uh, suspected illegal activity at Iran's nuclear sites. And as President Biden has said, unless and until Iran uh, declares what happens to those uh, at those sites, which Iran has not done, but there's, there's not going to be any return to the JCPOA. If there's going to be an interim deal that caps enrichment at 60 percent, depending what, on what Iran gets in return, I think that would be worth considering. Okay, uh, lady, gentlemen, let's uh, please feel free to engage in a conversation, to interact from this point onwards. Uh, and, and, you know, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is saying loud and clear, if we want to, nothing will stop us uh, from uh, getting nuclear. If a deal is indeed to be revived, will the nuclear gun get off the table, Mr. Goldberg? Well, the, the number one question always is whether or not there is a credible threat of military force from the United States and then secondarily from Israel. If Tehran believes the United States military is ready and willing to act to destroy its nuclear program or at least set it back significantly, then that obviously creates some deterrence. If they don't see that in effect, then everything else is just uh, conjecture and just waiting for the Iranians to escalate and finally cross the threshold at the time of their choosing. Ms. Levin, uh, yeah. Yeah, the interview. You know, we have to remember how we got here. Uh, the Trump administration withdrew from this agreement uh, when Iran was in full compliance with it. That's why we're in the state that we're in now. Um, and and uh, people like uh, Richard Goldberg were the ones who, you know, strongly lobbied for the U.S. to get out of that deal. Um, I think we have to take what we can get, frankly, at this point, because there is no military solution to the Iranian nuclear program. They have too much expertise. They 
know too much. There are too many facilities. They're widely dispersed. Some of them are underground. So this is, this is a fictitious threat. Uh, what we can do, though, is provide some economic benefits that Iran needs, and that's where our leverage lies. So, yeah, Meyer, you... Yeah, <laughs> no, Ms. Well, Slavin, if I, if I understand correctly, uh, uh, you, you too are, are, are suggesting that the U.S. is compromising for the lesser of, of two evils to an extent. Well, Look, very much so. Day... I mean, the administration tried to revive the old deal, uh, but it didn't work and yeah. ran out of time. And of course, the Russian intervention in Ukraine very much muddied the waters. So this looks like the best, frankly, all the parties can get at this point. As much as I blame President Trump for leaving the deal, I also blame Ayatollah Khamenei for not allowing Rouhani and Zarif at the end to return, uh, to at least have some kind of negotiations with President Trump. If Khamenei really cared about the well-being of the Iranian people, he would have at least given the diplomacy a chance, because we know what the sanctions are doing to the Iranian people. Unfortunately, we hear in Iran there are girls as, as, as young as 13 or 14 being, being sold into prostitution because of the incredible poverty that the people of Iran are going through. The people of Iran, as far as I know, don't support Khamenei's nuclear strategy. They've never had any say in it. And if Mr. Khamenei really cared, as much as I don't, I don't agree with what, what Mr. Trump did, he would have allowed the negotiations to resume. But he's not doing it, and he's stonewalling the IAEA, and I think this is something to, do, to take into consideration. One other point before I hand back the conversation. What brought the Iranians to the table with Mr. Obama was a, con, 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 uh, was a uh, mm. mixture of three factors. Military threat, sanctions, and also something which President Trump did not have, but Obama did, international consensus. President mm. Obama had uh, Russia and China on board, and this was incredibly important to the Iranians, and they took that very seriously, which is why they came to the 2015 uh, deal, and we should not rule out any of those uh, leverages that the West has. I think we're all living in some sort of fantasy world in this conversation. Because we're still talking about the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism that never agreed to give up its sponsorship of terrorism, the largest ballistic missile force in the region that continues to advance its missile force and never agreed to any constraints on ballistic or, miss or cruise missile research and development. Uh, the fact that this is a regime that hid a secret nuclear archive, multiple sites, Mayor has talked about, from international inspectors during negotiations during the JCPOA. Some of its nuclear negotiators now saying they also hid secret pipes they would use to reconstitute certain facilities uh, at any time of their choosing. They didn't have to give up any of their R&D on advanced centrifuges. We now see the evidence of that in front of us. And so let's not be in this world where the JCPOA was this magical deal that had arrested Iran's nuclear program. It actually legitimized Iran's pathway to get nuclear weapons patiently while getting trillions of dollars along the way. Let's also remember that Iran nuclear enrichment today, the vast majority of its expansion came under President Biden, not under President Trump. The minute maximum pressure was pulled back in 2021 and replaced with maximum concessions to try to get back what, to this What concessions? What did Biden deal. give him? What did Biden Iran, give him, Richard? What are you talking oh, that's, that's, about? Well, that's Iran not true. That's not true. to higher and higher uh, levels after thank, thank Israel you. assassinated its chief nuclear scientist. Most he was not a scientist, not Barbara. Barbara. That's not true, Barbara. Barbara, he was that's not a scientist. Not he was an RGC officer, senior general. He was not a scientist. Well, he was assassinated just before Biden came in, and the Iranian parliament passed legislation requiring it to ramp up enrichment and to reduce its cooperation. Well, the with same IRGC the during just after JCPOA tested two missiles writing on it in Hebrew that my country, where I live, where I have my children, should be wiped off the face of the earth, Barbara. So if you're going to talk about Mr. Uh, Fakhri Zadeh being a victim, please remember to which organization he belongs and how my family, more than your or Richards is being targeted by his organization. His organization <laughs> declared war on my country, so in sure. war, we know what happens. Well, we also know that Israel has 90 nuclear warheads, so it's not exactly defenseless. It also has a vast arsenal. Well, should we use it against Iran, Barbara? How does that work? We don't even we don't even we don't even admit we have a nuclear weapon because we don't want to <laughs> encourage other countries. We have nuclear My weapons, God. Barbara, because you know better than anybody else because you lost your family in the Holocaust. It's got nothing to do with Iran. This was never an Iran issue. 
my attention. I'm not going to get into a fight with you about about Iran's repulsive rhetoric. I would point out to Richard that the it's not just rhetoric, Barbara. It touches our lives. It doesn't touch your life in Washington. How many suicide bombings in Washington have been paid by Iran, Barbara? Do you know how many people have lost their lives on the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv after Oslo 1 and Oslo 2? As much Meyer, as I'm against Netanyahu, the person who killed Oslo 1 and Oslo 2 was the Iranian regime okay. and its support for terrorism. But what I have Do to say at the end of the day, let's just... Do you also have nuclear weapons? That's a question. If you don't want the Iranian regime to have nuclear weapons, you have to reach some sort of understanding. If that you I cannot agree. reach... That I agree right. with. I think I, it's, I, I think I, it's I fiction. I think it's fiction to think the Iranians are going to give up their nuclear, okay, yeah. nuclear enrichment. Yeah. That I would like it to okay. happen. I would like many things, but uh, I think that's fantasy, yeah, um, unfortunately. Mr. Goldberg, please chime in, yeah. <laughs> I would just say that in, in general, democracies have to have a bottom line here. We're not just going to negotiate with terrorists and just make believe that we can legitimize them into Westerners. Uh, these are bloodthirsty, uh, terror-sponsoring uh, regime agents, uh, as Mayor is talking about. Uh, they do have a plan in place. They would like to, at some point, develop nuclear weapons, and they're building the capabilities to do that with threats to cause another Holocaust by wiping Israel off the map. I know, and of course, but, but, but Richard, you're always States, not going to stop we them. The Richard, you're the always not going to stop we, them. But remember, Mayor, we are the large state in the United States. Uh, Israel is the little state. In, and so in the end, our bottom line has to be military deterrence. If we're unwilling to threaten military force, uh, then Iran at some point will get nuclear weapons, period, whether you do it Barbara's way, my way, or Mayor's way. If you are willing to threaten that military force and have a bottom line and deter the regime, then you open up a range of options for pressure, deterrence, uh, uh, persuasion, okay. yeah. uh, coercion, I, and rollback. Yeah, Ms. Barbara Slavin, please. Yeah. Yeah. I've been hearing these threats of military, uh, uh, the military option and so on for over 10 years, and Iran has increased its, uh, not only does it have a more potent program, uh, nuclear program, but it's also much more influential in the Middle East. So I'm sorry, Richard, your way has not worked. Uh, well, your way apparently is Joe Biden's way of the last two years, which is an utter policy failure. I think no, I actually, think what, what, what I think if I, I think as Zarif spoke for six and a half hours in Clubhouse the other night, he, the, the the amount of fear and he's right. We saw in Iran that President Obama had the international community behind him. The second the Iranian regime sees the international community behind Israel and the United States, then they're going to take us far more serious than they are. Uh, with with with, the, with Mr. Trump, unfortunately, it was the opposite. What he did, he was alone, and Netanyahu supported him, and he was alone. We need to to make to make the military deterrence and sanctions work. We need to have consensus, and for that, and President Biden has it, Richard. I know you're you're right. You're an American. You can choose whoever you want, but President Trump did not have the international backing of and Biden. And yet, and yet, it appears that Iran is uh, regaining international uh, credit on its own, and we will dive uh, back. Uh, dive further into that right after uh, the break. So uh, do stay with us, Barbara Slave and Richard Goldberg and Mayor Javid and Far. A few minutes break, and we're back with the summit. Do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the summit. Still with us, Mayor Javid Anfar, Richard Goldberg, and Barbara Slavin. Thank you all very much for staying with us. We're also, of course, uh, staying on topic. But before we get back to our conversation, um, uh, you, know, you know, if well, while Iran is saying nothing will stop us from getting the bomb, if and when others are saying, well, if nothing will stop us from pre preventing it to do so, or at least try to, is Israel and uh, the U.S. playing good cop, bad cop here to an extent? Here's what Benjamin Netanyahu had to say earlier today. Israel's security policy and situation are the direct result of Israel's strength. The continuing policy of my government is to cultivate this strength. Of course, this is being challenged by the rise of the new power in the region, which has completely replaced the Arab world in hostility to Israel and aspires to our destruction, and this is Iran. Over 90% of our security problems stem from Iran and its proxies, and our policies aimed at increasing the circle of peace 
to stop Iran and its proxies. Our position is clear. No agreement with Iran will be binding to Israel, which will continue to do everything to defend itself. With one hand, we are working to stop Iran, and with the other, we are working energetically to expand the circle of peace. These pose major challenges and great opportunities for us. Okay, let's get to it. Another quick fire round, 30 seconds uh, each. Uh, no other way to put it. Has Israel failed on uh, the Iran nuclear front? Mayor Javed Anfar, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. Um, I don't think Israel has failed. I think uh, I, we, well, it, we were doing very well as long as the JCPOA was, uh, was, uh, was still continuing. Iran's nuclear program was under inspections. We knew what was going to happen. Since then, everything is out of control. They are enriching uranium at 60 percent, and uh, our relations with America are, are, not, are under threat because of Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, uh, judicial reform. So we are doing badly because of, uh, some, of some of the policies, but uh, it's not too late. Okay, Barbara Slavin, your thoughts? Yeah, I would say Israeli policy has failed. I think that the lobbying effort to get uh, Trump to leave the deal when there was nothing else to replace it was a huge mistake. And I think Netanyahu is playing his usual games. He's got a lot of domestic problems, as Meyer pointed out. Uh, U.S. views of Israel are not what they were uh, some time ago, and so I don't see uh, I don't see Israeli policy really working very well on Iran. Richard Goldberg, your take. Well, I think the jury is obviously out uh, and will be decided if and when there's either destruction or setback of Iran's nuclear program or something goes boom in a desert uh, and there will be a, a catastrophic failure of a policy. But the truth is that right now Israel is the only actor in the region willing to take hostile action inside Iran against Iranians. Uh, and that is very valuable for the West. Well, uh, I do want us, uh, from this point onwards, of course, to feel uh, free to engage in a conversation. And I do want us to circle back uh, into a point um, uh, Mayor Javadan Farah made earlier, the international um, uh, leeway or card uh, here. You know, the rapprochement with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, military, naval uh, maneuvers with India, Pakistan, uh, strategic relations, of course, uh, with Russia, China, and, and many other that uh, we can point out. Bottom line, um, has the days of Iranian isolation simply over, Mayor? The Islamic Republic, since its uh, victory on uh, in February 2000, uh, 1979, has never belonged to an alliance. But since the February 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it now unofficially is in an alliance with Russia and also with China. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians are 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 uh, confronting the United States. I'm not going to call it the Cold War because the cold during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the economies of the United States and Russia were not coupled, as if you want to put it that mm. way, as the economies of China and United States are in in an incredible way. But there yeah. is a new war. Uh, there's a new war going on between uh, China, headed by China. Uh, second lieutenant is uh, is uh, is Russia, and Iran is a more junior officer. And Iran now belongs to an unofficial alliance. And this is what Ayatollah Khamenei always warned Putin since he met him the first time in 20, uh, in sorry, 2002, that you cannot trust the Americans. And now he's saying, look, I told you so. And Putin yeah. is agreeing with him. And the dependence of Russia on, on Iran is unprecedented. I repeat, unprecedented. This gives Iran leverage. And I think more than any other developments that you mentioned, Eli, the, the alliance with relations with Russia and relations with China are boosting Iran's confidence and its and the position of the regime in in terms of how it sees itself. Barbara, I can see that you're in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. No, I largely agree. I think we're seeing a, a sort of Eurasian détente hmm. that is is emerging for the first time. Uh, you know, it's the, the whole Middle East, and we just had a big piece on the Stimson Center website about the sort of the emerging multipolar Middle East, which has both opportunities and, and risks uh, for Western countries. But we have to recognize that um, Iran has ex uh, escaped its isolation, its escaped sanctions uh, through its ties with Russia and China and many other countries, including the United Arab Emirates. And now, of yeah. course, it's normalized 
relations with Saudi Arabia, which has not joined the Abraham Accords, but not has yet, at least. Yeah. Um, well, and that takes us back to Washington. What does it does it all elevate or undermining uh, the the American global standing? What messaging other adversaries are getting? Be patient enough and get what you want. Uh, just wait for a White House reshuffle, uh, Richard Goldberg. Well, that's certainly the message coming out of last week's board meeting in Vienna for the International Atomic Energy Agency, where now the second of four investigations into these undeclared nuclear sites is being shelved because of a lack of willpower by the Western powers to hold Iran accountable. Listen, I, I think that I agree with, with Mayor in, in his assessment of this uh, triangular access forming of Iran, Russia, and China uh, for their own strategic interests at the moment. Uh, but let's not forget that inside Iran, it's very destabilized still. Uh, internal unrest continues on a weekly basis. We've been tracking it. The media wants us to believe that the uprising is over. It's not. There's still widespread protests on a weekly basis. Mm. The economy continues to, to be in shambles. Uh, the West is still restricted uh, from trade and investment. And even with these deals you see with Saudi Arabia, de-escalation deals, there's still U.S. sanctions, impediments right. to banks and big financial investments. So it's really about the Western willingness to confront Iran. Mm -hmm. And I think right now we're having this split personality, especially in Europe, where there's uh, Western Europeans who are still so attached emotionally to JCPOA, but at the same time seeing the war in Ukraine and Iran's role there escalating, and we're gonna we're gonna really see that come to a head this fall when the next sunset kicks in in October. That's the missile embargo goes away under JCPOA uh, without the snapback. That of course, if you snap back, would end any idea of returning to a JCPOA that everybody seems to say is dead anyways. Yeah. Uh, but on the flip side, would would create international legitimacy for Iran transferring not just its drones, but potentially ballistic missiles to Ukraine as well. Yeah. So, um, Mayor, bottom line, looking um, uh, looking ahead, uh, is Biden's Iran gamble going to pay off or backfire? I think President Biden is acting in a very responsible manner. He's telling the Iranians that, look, uh, President Obama forgave and for, for, forget, forgot and forgave Iran on the mm -hmm. issue of Parchin. I'm not going to do that with these two uh, other sites that uh, the United States is waiting for. Uh, we later found out from the documents brought out by Mossad that, that there had been military use in Parchin. There's even photograph of it. President Biden saying, no, this time I'm not going to go back to the deal unless you clarify what you, what you were doing at Tor Ghazabad at, a, at an, another site. And, I, a site. and I think that's very responsible. Also, we have to remember that President Biden is running for re-election. And last right. but not least, Ellie, just one quick point. I'm not sure the people of Iran would would agree with the with the widespread concessions given to the regime at this point, because we are talking about the post Mahsa Amini uprising. The mm. amount of hatred that the people of Iran have for the regime, if United States comes and pulls them out of the isolation, I don't think I don't think everybody in Iran is going to agree with that. But last but not least, I'm not sure Khamenei wants to go back to the JCPOA, because the people around him are making millions and billions of dollars circumventing sanctions, and he needs their support. Mm, so there's something to gain by being isolated. Uh, interesting uh, enough to ask you all uh, to come back on the show uh, sooner rather than later. Barbara Slavin, Richard Goldberg, Mayor Javid Anfar, thank you so very much for this enlightening conversation.